I'm uh, Pat Rooney with the Palm Beach Kennel Club. Uh, we've been in business since 1932. I have Mr. Rooney here. He has been so nice. I've been able to pull him after a so-called, you know, uh, lunch. He might be full, fat and full, but he's going to allow me to answer some questions on Diversify Game. I'm kind of nervous because I got the music going. I hope YouTube doesn't demonetize me, but on the podcast, it'll be all good. I welcome you to Diversified Game, where we like to show entrepreneurs and talk about how they started, sustained, and succeeded in business. This is a great facility you have. What did it take to get this? And just, I'm not just talking money, but the mental that you, your father had to put in. Well, I mean, this is the epitome of a family business. My grandfather actually, uh, when he came down here from Pittsburgh, he would drive through Palm Beach County on his way to Hialeah, mainly down in uh, Miami to bet. And and so when he would come through Palm Beach County, and again, he's not around anymore, so I can't verify this, but I'm assuming he knew that there was a dog track here and saw that the potential uh, as an investment more than anything uh, to at some point maybe purchase it. So in 19... 1969-1970, uh, it became available uh, on the market, and my grandfather, along with uh, my dad and his brothers, decided to make a bid on it, and the, the owner at the time, a guy named John Bo Bogiano, wanted to get out, and he took the, took the bid, and then uh, we started operating it, I think, in 1970. It was a very, very small seasonal business at the time, I'm pretty sure it only ran from like November to April, and um, and that's to match the population. Most of the people that came down here came down here for those months, and then they went back up north or somewhere else. And uh, so we we ran it as a seasonal business for for pretty much that first decade, um, decade and a half, and then dog racing itself became much more popular in the late 70s, early 80s and uh, started racing a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Uh, we were able to get simulcast uh, where we could basically bet on other tracks uh, in the country in the early to mid 90s and, um, and that elongated the season here. Uh, and then eventually we just were racing year round and, and we were able to get poker in the late 90s. Um, so a bunch of different things happened to, to make it much more of a business than probably my grandfather envisioned uh, when, when he took it over in 1970. Now, keeping, you know, that's a lot of people involved in the business. Families now, it's like, do we even have families? They're broken up. What are some of those key things that have been able to keep it in the family where you haven't had to, you know, sell, I hope not, to places like China, that, you know? No, there, it's, it's been... You know, we, we have a big family. I mean, each of the five brothers is married and and has anywhere from four to nine kids. And now those kids have kids. Uh, so it, it just was almost per chance than anything else. My my oldest uh, uncle, Uncle Dan, and, and my, the next oldest, Uncle Art, basically stayed in Pittsburgh and, and, and were helping to run the Steelers. The next brother, Tim, uh, was was fortunate enough to he initially was running this place and then uh, went to Yonkers in New York and ran that uh, harness track up there until the last couple of years when we sold that so it, it sort of fell to the youngest two which is my dad and my uncle John who um, are twins and then my dad basically took over running this in 1983 84 and uh, he ran it until uh, essentially about 2007 and that's when I took over so it wasn't like a conscious thing where uh, either my grandfather or one of the uncles said are right, you Pat senior are gonna run it it just sort of happened that you know he uh, my dad was coming down to Florida a lot and had a house here and uh, ended up um, taking this over when another business that we had in Philadelphia uh, was sold and, and, and then it just so happened to coincide with the explosion of, of dog racing, simulcast, and poker that uh, when my dad took over, a lot of those things were, were coming to 
fruition at that time. So uh, it was it was a lot more than anything. But but our particular family's involvement just happened because uh, uh, my dad being sort of at the right place at the right time to, to take over uh, in the early 80s. I love the, you know, when you talk, there's no fluff nowadays. Everything is fluff, flair. I made a billion dollars last yeah. night <laughs> in the metaverse, <laughs> right? Right. Um, talking about, you know, Pittsburgh, and I, I love that, you know, you said I, I could not have been a Philadelphia fan because of the ties to Pittsburgh. Um, and you're here in Florida, though. Have you ever tried to make a run saying, you know what, I want a piece of Miami's team? Or... Not that I, not me personally, mm -hmm. and, and not, um, you know, I know there were, if you're talking specifically about the Dolphins, I know they, they've got cross ownership rules and things like that. But, uh, and they actually had that with, uh, with the other three major sports too, until, until relatively recently. Now you see guys that are breaking off and owning parts of hockey or football or, or, or basketball or even, um, uh, I mean, one of the now one of the minor minority owners of the Steelers also owns part of the Philadelphia 76ers. So it's kind of odd that uh, I'm a Sixer fan and also obviously a Steeler fan that, that now I have a very, very small connection to that too. But now, I, I mean, we, you know, we, my grandfather, and then I think that was brought down to the brothers as well. Uh, sort of just stay in your lane, work on what you know, work on Pittsburgh, make sure that the fans there are, are happy with the product that they're putting on the field and, and, and to make sure that that's the best experience it can be. Um, we never had, as far as I know, inclinations to branch out into other markets or anything like that, even though a lot of guys have done that successfully. Um, they sort of were content with, you know, let's stay in Pittsburgh and make this the best, uh, the best run team that we can have. Uh, in, in Pittsburgh. And we are at, again, the Sports Business Club of Palm Beaches. That's a terrible shot of it, but you guys got to understand, I dragged the man out of just talking for, you know, two hours. Can You don't run away from the racial history of sorts. You talk about it all the time. Like, every time I come here, you don't run from those tough, the history of the, the country. Do you think we'll ever see a black majority owner in the NFL? What will it take? Because we've had many people say, Puffy, hey, I've tried to own a team here. They won't let me in. It's a tight club. Wh how far are we going to have to go before we see that as a headline? Because it would only make things smoother if we get somebody in. I, I, I don't think it's going to be much longer. I, I, I think when you see a guy like Deshaun Watson get almost a quarter of a billion dollars that's that's pretty much guaranteed money money talks with everything and and and, and you mentioned uh, pup but at some point guys are going to have enough money that and, and i i'm hopeful that we as a country are moving to the point where you're not looking at something from the color of a guy's skin as to whether he he or she can be a good owner or a good uh, uh representative of a team in terms of hey I'm part of the club now and 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 we're going to do things you know a, a certain way I, I I just think and I'm hopeful that as a country that we are we're we're there we're I, I think it's just going to be a matter of the right person like Michael Jordan kind of did with the uh, with the Charlotte team I, I think it just takes the right type of person to get together with other people that are going to come together with the money that they need to do it and um and that, and then it's going to happen. I, I don't think it's much more than just getting getting the money, the resources, and the the, the, the guys that you need uh, to, from a marketing standpoint, economic standpoint, whatever it is. You know, my grandfather when when he got involved in the 1930s, the, the league was just such a uh, you know a different animal back then. It was so small and really regarded as a minor sport. And they were looking for anybody to, to, to get involved to, to help, you know, keep it afloat. And that's not where it is anymore. It's, a, it's just such a, you know, huge multi-billion dollar industry now that, um, uh, that, that it's, it's just become a different thing than when my grandfather was involved in it. But I will say this, you know, the way the world's going and, and again, the way the U.S. is going, I just don't think that, that race is, is, is going to be an issue at all with that. I think it's just a matter of uh, 
somebody coming along that has the wherewithal to do it, and the league, the league will will take them in. I, I, I just think that uh, we've come too far as a country to, you know, for it to be some kind of an issue because of somebody's color of their skin that's going to keep them out from uh, owning a team. Well, also, you guys as owners, is it a likability thing? Because you know. Kanye might not, or Elon Musk might not be the best owners when everyone kind of needs to agree. It, and It could be. And, and I, I, again, I'm not involved with any of the decision making in terms of, you know, who gets in or not. But you got a guy like Dan Snyder in Washington who they're now, I think, actively trying to get out of because of so many issues that have gone on with that team um, that... Yeah, they, 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 at some point it's going to be like, can we get somebody that, that is going to represent you know, 70% or whatever it is of, of, of the league is African American. Can we get somebody in that's going to represent uh, that group of guys that, you know, that, that, that knows kind of where they, where they came from, what they had to deal with to get to being an elite athlete and, and become part of the National Football League. And I think that is going to happen at some, some point, probably very quickly. You're going to have guys you know, for state reasons, for whatever, that need to get out, like the Bolins did and in, in, that's happening with Denver. You have guys that have to divest themselves of these multi-billion dollar assets because they don't want to get their families to have these ridiculous estate taxes associated with them. And that's sort of what happened in a, in a minor way with our family, uh, you know, 15 years ago. But that's that's much more of an issue now. And then you're going to have guys that, that do have the economic ability to take on a team and and the NFL's I, I think they're gonna they're gonna want to embrace having some diversity in ownership. Okay. Now here at the kennel, how far away are you taking this all to whatever the metaverse is, right? Which is just online and how things are going where people can bet their billion dollar crypto that they claim to have again made last night. Right. Uh, I mean that's that's sort of above my intellectual ability. I, I know we we deal with you know betters of all types that you know and and how they are betting now you got a, a cell phone and that's how a lot of people are doing a lot of their sports betting right now um so we're trying to as best we can we, we you know obviously we have facebook and and uh, instagram and all those other social media outlets and we try to be on them as much as we can um sports betting is a big component of i think the future of a facility like ours and i'm hopeful that we're able to get something done there um in the in the future with that but um yeah it, it's it's not just the the brick and mortar building anymore uh as, as to what the future is going to be with um with betting and and most people now just do it at home on their on their phones or on their computer and and i think that's the reality we try to tap into that as much as we can to let people know that if they want to come here um, you know, obviously we're going to give them some amenities that they might not be able to get at home, as well as the camaraderie of just being with other people that are, are, are betting on generally the same stuff that they are. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's always a challenge trying to find that next avenue of, you know, what, what people want and, and how they want to do it and, and providing that for them. Now, this is my signature question. I ask everybody because people think when I interview successful entrepreneurs, oh, it's just so easy and I'm just going to get the money and it's, but what is your community give back that you're doing or that you would like to do in the future? Well, we, we do. We have, uh, you know, a big component of, especially when I took over, um, you know, sort of running the facility is I wanted to look at our, our charitable giving, our community giving, you know, how we do things to relate with. Uh, not just the folks in the immediate surrounding area of the track, but in the county. You know, we, my dad's always said, we don't have a constituency. We don't have the people here that are going to, you know, gamblers are not going to, if, if there's a, a legislative bill or something that's going to happen that's going to impact, you know, your ability to, to bet or whatever. You're not going to have people here that are going to get up in arms and are going to be like, hey, we need to fight for the track and, and, and make sure this doesn't happen. They just don't operate that way. They'll find somewhere else to do it if, if you guys are negatively, if we're negatively impacted by something that's happening, again, from a legislative or legal or whatever standpoint. Um, so we, my job, I always felt 
a big part of my job was to get out there and let people know, number one, that we're here, what we do. You might not necessarily be a gambler or, or, or somebody that, um, you know, was big with dog racing or poker or any of those kind of type of things. But I do want people to know that we employ 500 people and those people have kids and, and, and they have, you know, like I do, a spe special needs kids or whatever. And we, we actively, proactively go out to try to employ folks that might not be employable elsewhere. And um, I, I, I want the community to know that and know by our giving to those various organizations that help folks in those situations that, um, that, that we understand the, the, the difficulties that they might have. And, and you know, we want to be part of the solution towards that. That's why we do a lot of Habitat for Humanity and, and uh, you know, beach cleanups and those types of things as, as individuals but also as a, as a group. Um, because, again, the message isn't going to get out there from our customers. That they're, they don't really care about uh, you know, that type of, of the aspect of, of the business. But uh, we need to make sure that the folks uh, in our community know we're here, know what we're doing, and know what we're about. And as much as I try not to pump up the charitable aspect too much of things, because in my opinion, true charity is, is done quietly, it's done humbly, it's done without a lot of people seeing it. Um, but unfortunately, or whatever word you want to use, for us, we have to make people know, know that we're out there and we're trying to do this stuff because otherwise no one else would, would be touting it. We have to get out there and do it. And let people, we have a golf tournament coming up here on Thursday um, that supports our military, it supports um, you know, autism. So, so we have to let people know that we're doing it, number one, so we can get some golfers out there. But, um, but I think it, it lets people know, hey, the image is in here. We're just not taking your money and, and doing, you know, doing with, with it what we will. We, we will. We're, we're using it and giving back, for lack of a better term. So. And you do more than just the gambling. You've had Andrew Dice Clay here. You've had different comedians from King of Queens. I was trying to get my wife to, hey, your favorite actor from, you know, King of Queens is is here. And for a Cameroonian, that's where she's from, to love King of Queens. Yeah. You know, so you do more than just that. You're going for sainthood, I, I believe. You're going for sainthood. I don't know about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting the rumor out there right now as a PR professional and a consultant. That's how yeah. I'm throwing it out because I've seen how you move, and I and I thank you for being able to share that. Can you let the people know the last good book you read and what people misunderstand about when you do have real wealth? You know, I, 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 I people have asked a couple times, like, what books are you reading? Believe it or not, it's it's tough for me to sit down with a book because I, I I'll have like a couple books and I'm I'm trying to read through them, and you know you get through the day and it's just this sounds horrible as, as I get older. As soon as I start reading something, I'm falling asleep, and and so I can be barely watch TV anymore without starting to fall asleep. I keep telling my doctor I probably got some kind of narcolepsy or something, but I I, I don't particularly read books or, or magazines or anything like that for like some kind of divine in, intervention or inspiration as to all right maybe i could be doing this to, to run the business better the only thing I, I operate on a lot of times are just instincts and gut feel and and trying to be in tune as best i can with with what i'm seeing specifically with our customers and with our employees and then getting feedback from them on all right, just like we talked about, like with the comedian stuff, that's something we try to do here because this particular room is not really functioning anymore for dog racing because we don't have it. So what else can we do to repurpose this thing uh, to, to still bring people in here and especially maybe never come to the track at all and have some kind of a positive experience? So that's something that we made a conscious effort to. I reached out to our publicity folks, our um, you know, community folks and said, is this going to, are we going to have five people here if we do this or are we going to be able to attract a crowd? Some of, the, some of the comedians have been much more popular than others, but for the most part, We've generally got, you know, 50, 60, 70 people, and then for Dice Clay and some of these other ones, we sold it out, so we've had over 300 people for it. Uh, but the whole point of it was to try to attract folks here that might not ever have come here before, and that's the feedback. Without doing a formal survey or anything like that, a lot of people will come up, I've never been here before, I've never come to the room, I've seen it when I come go to the airport or whatever, and that's, to me, it's made that part of this worth it 
to to, to to at least at the very least get exposure to some folks that have never entered into this building before. Now the hope is that maybe they'll see something, they'll come back, they'll enjoy the food, and they'll say, you know, maybe we don't gamble, but we'll come here because the food's good. And that's that's part and parcel of it. So there's not a, a manual or anything like that that I've, I've kind of fallen back on to say th these are the steps you need to take to be successful. It's really just engaging as much as I can and the staff as much as I can. What feedback are you getting from folks? Is this something that they like doing? Is it working? If it's not, that's fine. Let's move on and try something else. Um, but so far, some of these things that we've tried uh, thrown up on the wall have actually stuck. So I think we're going to keep continue doing them and then hopefully, um, you know, maybe we, we can be known as a, com a comedy club. I have no idea, but, but that's the hope in the long run. And I threw one last one in about wealth. People are trying to get wealthy, and then they feel that once I'm wealthy, all my problems will end, or my wife will like me, my kids will like me more. What's a misconception that you... Well, yeah, yeah no, listen, don't get me wrong. Money makes things a lot easier in your life if, if that's not the driving component towards, you know, oh, we can't do this because we can't afford gas. Or we, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to be in that where, where a $6 gallon of gas isn't really bothering you, and there's very few people that are in in that category but um, but money doesn't it, it, you know the old sayings are true money doesn't bring happiness money doesn't solve all of your problems sometimes it creates more than than what you think it would you you're always going to have people around you that aren't going to have as much money as you do and they're going to be like hey can you help me out can you do this and and you you might want to do that but is that ultimately really helping them get to where they need to be in terms of the direction in their life? I have no idea. I, I help as many people as I can. Um, sometimes it does it, it does get them over a hump and, and they're able to go on. Sometimes it doesn't and it, it, it just creates more problems for them. Um, like I said, money does help, help you get through some of the, the basic obstacles that you might have in life, but in terms of success and happiness and contentment, it's it's not the be all end all. Those are things you have to work for in a lot of yourself. I, I you know, without getting too overly spiritual, I, I I I believe in God, and I believe that God gives everybody a certain amount of talents, and it's up to you to exploit those talents and work on them and try and figure out what the best use of them are, and then money a lot of times will flow from that from that work and that um, uh, putting yourself out there to. to uh, to see what what you can do to, to be successful, um, and, and and I think that's that's where everybody, you know, not everybody makes it to that level of contentment and satisfaction. But that's what you should be striving for, and money usually follows that. When when you're successful in your personal life, doing what you like to do, then then the money usually flows. But even if it doesn't, you're still doing something that you enjoy doing. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money and are miserable. They just they're in jobs that they hate and they're around people they hate and they take that home and they end up getting divorced and things like that and that's that's I think one of the biggest misconceptions about money is that um, all of your problems are solved and in reality sometimes it causes more problems than not so um, I hate to get too philosophical on you but my my thing is you've got to try to find something that you really enjoy doing with people that you enjoy doing it with and Usually everything else takes care of itself at that point. You guys have its purpose over everything. You guys have got the game. If you want more, you're either going to have to come to the business club, check out the website, links will be in the description, or you're going to have to wait for Mr. Rooney to write his book, and then we'll hear about you know how you kept your family. Someday, someday yeah, someday soon. And it can be an audio book. Maybe I'll do that. That would yeah. be easier for me. Yeah. So I thank you. You guys have been blessed by the game. Make sure you share this with someone. It will change their life. Are you tired of the rat race in America? 
Are you ready to visit the motherland to relax and rejuvenate? Are you ready to explore all that Africa has to offer? Then check out the brand new Diversified Game Academy course, Prepare for My First Trip to Africa. Are you worried about being able to afford the trip? We got you. We will show you how to travel either on a budget or as a baller. Learn how to stress the value of the USD. Did you know that 100 United States dollars is worth over 1,000 South African Rand or 10,000 Kenyan shillings or 54,250 West African CFA? Are you worried about taking your kids? Get the game from Kellen Cash, a bona fide world traveler, having traveled to almost 20 countries, several of those in Africa. Get the game on taking your kids on their first trips. Learn how to find the best tickets, get the visas, and plan your own adventures in Africa. Don't let Eddie Murphy have all the fun. Plan your own coming to Africa trip starring you, produced by you, and featuring you. If you are ready for a life-changing experience, sign up for our course today, Diversified Game Academy. Get prepared and purchase at DiversifiedGame.com.